In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All you peoples, clap your hands. Shout to God with joyful cries. For the Lord the Most High inspires all, the great King over all the earth, who made people subject to us, brought nations under our feet, who chose a land for our heritage, the glory of Jacob, the Beloved. God mounts the throne amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid trumpet blasts. Sing praise to God, sing praise. Sing praise to our King, sing praise. God is King over all the earth. Sing hymns of praise. God rules over the nations. God sits upon his holy throne. The princes of the peoples assemble with the people of the God of Abraham. For the rulers of the earth belong to God, who is enthroned on high. Lord, you are God, and you are King, and you have enthroned yourself in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of bringing the nations into your kingdom. As if it weren't for that, most of us here would not be able to be a part of your people. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your providence, for the gift of your plan hidden through the ages but revealed in Jesus Christ and to the apostles and in their ministry brought about. Lord, thank you tremendously for blessing us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, be present now and let your Holy Spirit bow all hearts in love and truth today, to hear your word and keep your way. Give us the grace to grasp your word, that we may do what we have heard. Instruct us through the scriptures, Lord, as we draw near, O God, adored. To God the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, three in one. To you, O blessed Trinity, be praised throughout eternity. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I began by praying Psalm 47. So if you guys want to mark that, that's that's a psalm which talks about uh, the Davidic covenant, and the Davidic kingdom, the kingdom under David and Solomon, and how this kingdom is international. It's also over the nations, and we're going to look into this some more. In just a moment. Now, one time I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who's a deacon, and and I was in graduate school and and, uh, and at the time, and I was and I was talking to this deacon. He's a permanent deacon, so he's older and you know is married, and and he uh, and we were talking, and he was he asked me. He said, well, "So what are you studying?" And I gave him some topics about what I was studying and telling him what I was excited about, what I was you know what I was learning. And somehow the topic got to the New Covenant and what was happening and the biblical theology I was studying. And this deacon kind of looked at me and he said, you know, you know, I, really, I don't think that, that Jesus really intended for Gentiles to join the church. I think that it was mainly you know, among Jews. And then later on, his followers started incorporating Gentiles into the church. And, but I don't think that was originally what Christ had in mind. Because if you look at it, you know, he chose just Jewish apostles and the church was pretty much primarily Jewish. And, but I had to go at that moment. But I was thinking to myself, good grief, you know, what kind of a formation have you had? And hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll see that that is nowhere to be found in scripture. That's, that's a misconception. I I don't know where he got this from. And this is why we need to pray for the, diac- the diaconate formation programs, especially in the United States. Um, because, man, whatever they're teaching these people, I don't, I don't get it. But tonight's chapter is chapter 23, Reaching Out to All Nations. And chapter 25, excuse me. And here's a word that you all are familiar with. Gentile. And we get the word Gentile from a Latin word, gentilis. 
you, you can G E N T I L I S. And gentilis is the Latin word that translates a Greek word, ethnos. Ethnos. And ethnos is a Greek word that translates the Hebrew word goyi. Goyi. It can be goyi or goyim. I'm going to go with goyi. Is, uh, is how we transliterate it. G-O-W-E-E. -E, the goyi. And these all mean the exact same thing. And that is the nations. The nations. As opposed to or separate from the nation of Israel. And so, you know, a lot of times you're reading St. Paul, you're reading Romans, for instance. And St. Paul's talking about how the gospel is preached to the Jews and to the Gentiles. But if you go back and you look at the words that St. Paul actually used, you know, he wrote his epistle to the Romans in Greek. And he says ethnos. He doesn't say gentiles. But the English translates it as Gentile, because we're, we know what a Gentile is, but what are we going to translate it as? The, the ethnes, you know, the ethnics? You know, it's just, and this is because for so long, Christians read and wrote in Latin that the, this word came to be known as Gentile. Okay, so this is kind of our the English word that we use. So a lot of times, ethnos is translated as gentilis in the Latin, and so it's translated as Gentile in English. And this is where you get the term ethnic from. You know, what's your ethnicity? Well, it comes from ethnos in, in Greek. And then in Hebrew, if you spoke Hebrew, anywhere in the Old Testament where it says the nations, you know, Psalm 47 that I just read from talked about the nations, the nations, the nations. Every time it says goi, goi, goi. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So it just depends on what language you're using. Hebrew, Greek, or Latin. So that's where the term Gentile comes from. It's not because, we're not talking about those people, you know, who are really soft spoken, you know, and, and uh, you know, wash with dove instead of, instead of uh, lava or whatever. Gentile, right. And so I guess, I guess Jews can't be gentlemen, right, because they're not Gentiles. So I don't, I don't know how that works. Okay. So there's a little bit of etymology, a little bit of linguic, linguistics, so we know what we're doing here. Okay, so in the time of Jesus, we've discussed this, how the Pharisees were very uh, nationalistic. In fact, that's where the Pharisees got their name from. They were the perushim. They were the separated. They wanted to separate themselves from the ethnos, from the, the nations, those people who were not Jewish. Because they thought that this is God's will, that you wanted to keep kosher food laws as perfectly as possible. You want to keep the ceremonial precepts of the law perfectly, and this is going to bring about the, the coming of the Messiah, the restoration of the kingdom, the, the exaltation of Israel and the defeating of the, the nations, the, the pagan oppressors, and into exile. This is going to come about by keeping the law. Well, Jesus and the apostles, and especially St. Paul, who was a Pharisee and then converted to being a Christian, a Jewish Christian, actually a Benjaminite Christian, if you want to get very specific, they, they saw something different. They said, no, the law had a purpose, a true purpose, and it was to keep you separate from the rest of the nations. But this is no longer God's will. The law was a temporary phenomenon. You wanted to be separate from the Gentiles for a reason, and we'll get into that. It'll be a little bit of a review. Okay, let's go all the way back to Adam. Remember Adam, you had, you had uh, Abel and Cain, and God you know, favored Abel because he gave a righteous sacrifice. He gave, you know, the fat, you know, he gave the, uh, the fat. Uh, he, uh, and he, uh, he gave the first, you know, the firstlings. Uh, but Cain didn't. Cain, Cain's uh, sacrifice was not as good. He wasn't quite as devoted to the Lord. Cain slew Abel. 
God raises up Seth, and then the birthright goes through Seth. And then so we have the Canaanite line and the Sethite line. Well, eventually, when of Seth's descendants, Noah, you know, has the birthright, and, and the Canaanite line had gotten so bad, so messy, that they ended up, God ended up having a flood to knock out the human race, and Noah becomes a new Adam. And Noah came, had the birthright, right? He's the chosen one, in a certain sense. And Noah, you know, he has Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the story, the, the Genesis narrative, follows not Ham, not Japheth, but Shem. And Shem's descendants ends up going down to Noah. I mean, I'm sorry, to Noah. Yeah, right. Ends up going down to Terah, the father of Abram. And so we know that Abram is God's chosen. God's going, to, God's going to bring about his purposes for humanity through... Don't pay no attention to the, the men in the, behind the curtain. <laughs> Quit looking over there. Look at me. <laughs> and so God's purposes for humanity are going to occur through Abraham, Abram. And in Abram, we have... We have three covenants made with Abram. What chapters in Genesis were these three covenants made? Genesis 15, 17, and 22. All right. In Genesis 15, it was made with Abram. Genesis 17... Abram's name is changed to Abraham, and now he's Abraham. And then in Genesis 22, the covenant is made with Abraham's seed, his Zerah. Zerah is the Hebrew word for seed. And so in Genesis 15, the covenant God makes is is to give land and nationhood. Land and nationhood to Abram's descendants. But Abram doesn't have a descendant. He, he's, he, he has no children. And God says, no, 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 I'm going to give you a kiddo. And his wife, I mean, they're old. They're, in their, you know, they're, they're really old. And they, they're like, there's no way that Sarai can have children. And God says, no, 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 I'm gonna, your descendants will be as countless as the stars in the sky and as the sands on the seashore. And so God makes this covenant, and he's going to give land and nationhood to Abram through his descendant. Whoever, you know, and, and God says that, you know, basically they're going to have a descendant, but they don't have faith. And Abram has Sarai go into Hagar, his concubine, and thus pops out Ishmael. Okay? Land and nationhood. Let's, let's look at Genesis fifteen eighteen. Genesis 15, 18. And there's something that's curious in the promise that God makes in this covenant. Genesis 15, 18. This is right after, you know, the God appeared as a smoking brazier in a flaming torch, which passed between the sacrificial animal pieces that we've discussed. It was on that occasion that the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land. <clears throat> this land. And remember, Abram is in what is later known as the promised land or the holy land, and that today is known as Palestine. I give this land from the wadi of Egypt to the great river. And then in captions, my Bible says the Euphrates, because that's what the great river was. Now notice that this land is not just the promised land, or Palestine, or the holy land. It goes all the way to Egypt, and all all the way to the Euphrates, in Mesopotamia. This is a huge chunk of land. This is not just this small piece of land. So in a certain sense, this promise of land is going to be, it's, it's larger than just what Israel is going to get when they finally enter the land, crossing the Jordan River under Joshua's leadership. Okay, just keep that in mind. Now in Genesis 17, let's turn there to Genesis 17, there's a covenant made, and 
focus is put upon Sarai, whose name is changed to what? Sarah. Sarah. And then those are two Hebrew uh, words that are different forms of the word princess. Okay, it's related to royalty. So there's a focus put on her name. And somehow this is going to have something to do with royalty in Genesis 17. Let's turn to Genesis 17, verse 15. God further said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, do not call her Sarai. Her name shall be Sarah. I will bless her, and I will give you a son by her. Him also will I bless. And then my New American Bible says, He shall give rise to nations. But that's, that's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, she will be a mother of nations. She will be a mother of goi. In Kings, Melech, you know Melchizedek, Melech, Melech is Hebrew for king. And kings of peoples shall issue from him. Okay, so we have... Uh, We're told, you know, we have a focus upon the name, which has to do with royalty. She will be a mother of nations, not just one nation, Israel, but nations. And kings will issue forth from her descendants. This descendant, specifically, who we know is going to be Isaac. So 17, we have kingship being promised. And then, in let's turn to First Kings. Go ahead and put keep your. No, you don't even have to keep your hand in Genesis. Let's turn to First Kings chapter five. First Kings chapter five, verse one. This is this is uh, talking about Solomon's kingdom. Solomon, who eventually is, you know, this kingship is given. Uh, First through Saul, but then really through David, the Davidic covenant, and then David's son, Solomon. And David's son, Solomon, you know, the king of Israel. Let's look and see what his reign looked like in 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines down to the border of Egypt. Sounds familiar, huh? This is the promise of land that was given in Genesis 15. See, notice Genesis 15 wasn't just about Israel and about their nationhood. Ultimately, it's, it's a, it has a bigger perspective. And Solomon, you see, Genesis 15 that promises this land is really kind of ultimately fulfilled in a certain sense in Genesis with the covenant in Genesis 17 when you're going to end up having kings because Solomon's kingdom isn't going to be just over the land that Israel has in the promised land, it's going to be over from Egypt all the way to Mesopotamia, to the river, the Euphrates. And so Solomon's kingdom, the Davidic kingdom, is international. It's international. It includes these other nations. Let's go back to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, verse 17. This is the third covenant made with Abraham. And Genesis 22, it's not made with Abram, like 15, not Abraham, like it was in 17, but it's made with Abraham's seed, his Zerah. And in Genesis 22, we're told that through Abraham's descendants, specifically through Isaac, his descendant, there's going to be worldwide blessing. Again, there's this... There's this this scope of internationality, worldwide blessing. Okay, so we're in Genesis 22. Actually, I'm not. You guys are. There we go. And it's uh, verse 17. And this is the promise. I will bless you abundantly and make your descendants as countless as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Your descendants shall take possession of the gates of their enemies. And in your descendants, 
all the nations of the earth, all the goyi of the earth, shall find blessing. All this because you obeyed my command. And if you want to look back at verse 2 of chapter 22, it says, Then God said, Take your son Isaac, your only one whom you love. Was Isaac Abraham's only son? No. There was also Ishmael. But God is, again, he's, he's choosing Isaac, the son of promise. He says it's going to be through Isaac. It's going to be through the Isaacites, not the Ishmaelites, that this is going to occur. And so Isaac uh, ends up marrying Rebecca. I, I know this because in our wedding, the first reading at our wedding was Rebecca, you know, getting off of her horse, you know, when she, she meets Isaac for the first time, when Isaac's servant brings her to him. His, my wife's name is Rebecca, so it was fitting. He marries Rebecca, and they have two kiddos. What are their names? Esau and Jacob. Esau sells his birthright for a pot of porridge, and so Jacob gets the birthright, and Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Israel is a bigamist. He's tricked into marrying Leah, and he really wants Rachel. So in a certain sense, his honor is kind of preserved. You know, he didn't want to be a bigamist, you know, but he happened to be one. And then he ends up going into their concubines, Zilpah and Bilhah, and out of these four women, the 12 tribes of Israel are born. Or more specifically, the 12 sons of Israel. The 12 sons of Israel. And so Israel is elected. It's chosen. It has the birthright. Now, uh, someone was asking me not too long ago, about a couple of weeks ago, someone who's not, who's not Christian asked me, they said, Carson, do you... Do you believe that the Jews are the chosen people? And and I said I said well well yeah uh, if we want we want to get back to you know the New Testament yeah the Jews certainly are the chosen people and not the Jews so much but the but Israel is the chosen it's just that the Jews were the remaining visible Israelites at the time but it's Israel that was chosen and the assumption behind the question was this. It was almost kind of, why are you Catholic and not Jewish? If the Jews are the ones who are chosen by God, why, why aren't you, you know, in an Orthodox Jewish com- community? Why, why are you? And so that was, a, you know, the, the idea that we have when we just hear that you're chosen, it's kind of like, oh, well, if you want to be saved, you have to join that group that's chosen, you know? But that's not the case. That's not what the, the, the Hebrew narrative means by chosen. To be chosen by God, to be the firstborn means that you're the servant. You're chosen to go out and to spread God's word, to tell others about God and to bring them into relationship with God. This was Israel's vocation. This was the vocation of the the elder, the firstborn. And so Israel was, was, was delivered from Egypt to go out to the nations, to bring God's law out there which they were going to get at Mount Sinai. And so Israel goes to Mount Sinai. They're just 12 tribes at this time. They're not a nation. They're just 12 tribes. And then at Sinai, God makes a covenant with Israel. And this covenant turns these 12 tribes into what? A nation. Yeah. This is where they become a nation. They get their national Law. They get the Book of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, which are part of the Book of the Covenant, Exodus 20 through 23. And so, you know, Moses is proud. He's got his people. He's at Mount Sinai. He's like, we're ready to go, God. You know, make, it, make us into a nation. You know, and what happens? They mess up big time. Apostasy. So what's given? No, not curses. Curses come when you disobey something that's given. What's given? The law. The law. Specifically the book of the covenant. The book of the covenant is given. And then more law is given in Leviticus. And then more law is given in Numbers because they keep sinning. So the law comes in. And when they sin with the golden calf, all the Israelites lose the priesthood. And who gets the priesthood? The Levites. The Levites. So Israel is reconfigured. 
to where now no longer can the Israelites, you know, be near the tabernacle. Now the Levites are going to encamp around the tabernacle, and then the tribes will encamp outside of the Levites. The Levites serve as a buffer zone. The Levites are kind of put over their, their brothers and sisters to kind of watch over them. And the law separates Israel from the nations. The law says when you go in and you, and you take Canaan, you know, I, you, you, can't, you can't be like them. You can't eat pork like them. You can't eat pork because what, what did you do as an Egyptian? You sacrificed pork. Now you can't sacrifice it. You can't eat it. And just as you worshipped sheep, rams, and goats, you now are, you're now commanded to sacrifice what you used to worship in Egypt. So the law is to root out idolatry, to root out this idolatry of Israel, to separate them from the nations, to kind of rehabilitate them, to get them back on course, to get them back on par, back in relationship with God. This is what the law is meant to do. And in Jesus' day, everybody's, you know, gung-ho about the law. Let's keep the law. We're supposed to be Israel. But, but they don't really quite understand that the law had a temporary purpose to rehabilitate Israel. The law, the Mosaic law was not meant to be eternal, you know, in the sense that, you know, this is how it's going to be forever. It was a temporary type of provision that was given. And so, you know, <clears throat> this first generation doesn't want to take the land. They're like, oh, you know, they're, 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 they have big, bad people in the land, so we don't want to take it, but Joshua and Caleb come back and they're like, yeah, well, we want to take it. So the Lord says, okay, you generation, I, I'm through with you. You're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and you're going to die here <clears throat> and your descendants will get the land that you guys don't get. But Joshua and Caleb, since you want to take it, I'm going to, I'm going to let you guys take the land too. You're going to outlive your brothers and sisters. And so their children come about the second generation. Are they faithful to God? No, Numbers 25, great apostasy, Baal worship at Beth Peor. Baal of Peor is worshipped. <clears throat> that specifically through, <clears throat> excuse me, having sex with, pro you know, these cultic prostitutes in Numbers 25. It's really bad. So Deuteronomy is given, the second law, to the second generation. Things are really bad. But time goes on. Time goes on, and the people keep kind of you know, turning away from the Lord. And finally, they want a king like all the other nations. And God tells Samuel, he says, it's okay, it's okay. Go ahead and anoint a king. It's not you that they're rejecting. It's me that they're rejecting and not wanting me to be their king. They're gonna, they want a king for themselves. Okay, so we'll, I'll give them what they ask for. Now they're going to be taxed twice. They're going to be taxed uh, once and then twice by the king. Uh, you know, their children are going to be taken as, you know, slaves by the king in a certain sense to do his bidding. You know, there's going to, a lot of not, not so great things are going to come along with the kingdom, but go ahead and give it to him. But God uses this to his purposes because he's going to make this king, he's going to have kings issue forth from Sarai and kingship is going to become a part of his plan. He's going to take up his, his uh, children's disobedience into his plan. <clears throat> And so, you end up having the Davidic Covenant. And the Davidic Covenant, as, as I just talked about a second ago, was international. It wasn't, it, it, God starts focusing apart from the Mosaic Law and starts focusing on the international aspects of what he wants to do. You know, in a certain sense, Israel, he thinks, is kind of ready for this. In fact, there's a man after God's own heart, David, that he does this through. And the Psalms celebrate the international aspect of the Davidic covenant. So like, for instance, let's turn to Psalm 2.8. We've been looking at Psalm 2 quite a bit. Let's look at it again. <clears throat> Psalm 2, verse 8. Psalm 2, verse 8 says... Only ask it of me, and I will make your inheritance the goyi, your possessions, your possession, the ends of the earth. Only, and this is, this is uh, the Lord speaking to the Davidic king. 
the son of David, the descendant of David, the king. Only ask it of me, and I will make your inheritance the nations, the goyi, your possession, the ends of the earth. With an iron rod, you shall shepherd them. Okay? So, there's, so the Davidic descendant, the king, is going to shepherd all of the nations, all of the goyi. Let's turn to Psalm 18. Psalm 18. And if, if your Bible counts the introduction to Psalm 18 as a verse, then, it, then we're going to look at verse 18. But if it doesn't count that introduction as a verse, we're going to look at verse 17. I'm sorry. Verse, it's either verse 43 or 44. 43 or 44. You rescued me from the strife of peoples. You made me head over the goyi. Okay? You made me head over the goyi. And this is a psalm of David, so it's David speaking. You made me head over the goyi. We can turn to Psalm 22, which is the famous psalm that Jesus evokes from upon the cross in Psalm 22. And again, if your Bible counts the introduction as a verse, we're going to start with verse 28. If it does not count that introduction as a verse, it's verse 27 of Psalm 22. All the ends of the earth will worship and turn to the Lord. All the families of the Goyi will bow low before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord the ruler over the nations. You see, even this is a Davidic type of psalm that Jesus quotes from the cross. And he quotes, you know, the, the uh, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me or forsaken me, right, at the beginning of it, to invoke the entire psalm. Psalm 47 is another one. We, I began with prayer with that. We can turn to Psalm 72. Psalm 72. And in Psalm 72, let's look at verse 8. This is a psalm of Solomon. If you look at the introduction right underneath the title, it'll say, of Solomon. But we want to look at verse 8. May he rule from sea to sea, from the river, the river, which is what river? The Euphrates which is like, kind of like the boundary, you know, in a certain sense of, of the known. From the river, the Euphrates, where his kingdom extended, to the ends of the earth. May his foes kneel before him, his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and the islands bring tribute. The kings of Arabia and Seba offer gifts. May all kings bow before him, all goyi serve him, all nations serve him. So again, the internet. So God in the Davidic covenant is saying, okay, okay, you guys have been separate from the nations for quite a bit, but now let's start reincorporating them. But not too quick, not too quick. You know, you'll have rule over them. You know, they'll be your slaves, your vassals. So you still want to, you know, it's like a teacher with the students. You don't want to be too close of a relationship, you know, or else your students will, will be like, oh, we can just do whatever we want now. The teacher loves us, he's our friend. You know, no, you want to keep a little bit of a distance. You know, you don't, well, that's kind of what this is like. It's like, okay, we're going to start incorporating the nations, but not fully. So the temple, which is the architectural symbol of the Davidic covenant, the temple includes a place for the Gentiles, the court of the Gentiles. But notice they can't go beyond the court of the Gentiles into, you know, the court beyond that. So they're still kind of excluded a little bit, but they're included a little bit. So there's, there's some inclusion happening here. Okay, so let's turn to Isaiah 2, verse 1. So now we're going to start taking a look at the prophets. And you'll notice a lot of these pro, the prophets arose in the time of the Davidic kingdom, uh, largely when it was divided. And also during the exile. So this is the kingdom, this is after the Davidic covenant had been made. So the, the prophets 
sometimes you'll notice that the prophets won't just prophesy against the tribes of Israel. Sometimes they'll prophesy against foreign nations. Huh, that's odd. So who does Jonah go to prophesy against? The northern kingdom of Israel, right? No, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, the Goyi. He's going to prophesy against. Whoa, why are you going to prophesy against them? Well, because they're a part of the Davidic covenant. Okay, Isaiah 2, verse 1. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah in Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills. Now, of course, this is speaking metaphorically. It's not like we're going to have you know, some sort of volcanic eruption beneath Mount Zion, and it's going to get really tall, you know, physically. No, this is, this is a, it basically it means that it's going to be exalted somehow. This is a metaphorical way of speaking. And the mountain of the Lord that's talking about here is Mount Zion, and the Lord's house is the temple. Many peoples, now it says, all nations, all goyi shall stream toward it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us climb the Lord's mountain to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, the early Christians reading this at the time of Pentecost and afterwards, guess what they saw in this? Where did Pentecost start? In the middle of Jerusalem, you know, from the, the new temple, the new Zion, the church, going out and, and proclaiming to all nations. This, is, this has been seen throughout Christianity as being fulfilled in the apostles, in Jesus Christ, in his church. Okay, from Zion shall go forth instruction. Okay, so it's, it says that these people are going to say that he may instruct us in his ways, that we may walk in his paths. So it's kind of like what Israel was supposed to do to begin with. We're, it's, the Israel is going to do. Eventually, this, this plan for Israel is going to have fulfillment. Because who are the apostles? They're Israelites. United with the Davidic king who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, Israel's king. Now we're going to get to, back to Isaiah in a moment. We're going we're to be looking some more at Isaiah. But let's turn to Zechariah. Zechariah is one of the last prophets. In the, it's the second to last book in the Old Testament. Malachi is the last one. The second to last is Zechariah. Let's turn to Zechariah 2. Zechariah 2, verse 14. And again, Zechariah is all about, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ and his ministry. In fact, Zechariah is quoted over and over again by the New Testament authors as, as referring to Jesus. Like, for instance... Have you guys ever, uh, do you guys remember hearing, um, they shall look on him whom they have thrust through? That's quoted in John 19, 37. Uh, you also have, and they counted out my wages, 30 pieces of silver. You know, that's, that's, in, Isaiah, that's in Zechariah. So I became the shepherd of the flock to be slaughtered for the sheep merchants. Um, that day his feet will rest, shall rest upon the Mount of Olives. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be dispersed. That's quoted in Matthew 26, 31. This is all Zechariah. Okay, Zechariah 2, verse 14. Sing and rejoice, O daughter Zion. See, I am coming to dwell among you, says the Lord. Many nations shall join themselves to the Lord on that day. And they shall be his people. Wow. The Goyi, the non-Israelites, are going to be God's people. That's, that's huge. And he will dwell among you, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Turn to Malachi. Malachi. Malachi is the next book, the last book of the Old Testament, as we have it in the, in the canon of Scripture. Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. 
Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. And the early church fathers quoted this verse to refer to the Eucharist. So when, we're, when you read the early church fathers and they talk about the Eucharist, quite often you'll see this verse quoted. Of course, it's not quoted chapter and verse. They didn't have chapter and verse back then, but they, they'll say as Malachi said or as, the, as the, the word says, as the Lord says. For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name is great, my shim is great, among the goyi, the nations. And everywhere they bring sacrifice to my name and a pure offering. For great is my name among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So you have... The, the Lord's name is great, not just among Israel, but among all the nations. They all bring a pure and spotless oblation, a spotless sacrifice to the Lord. Okay, so we can see that the Old Testament itself is pointing forward to the incorporation of the Gentiles, the ethnos, into the church. But now we're going to switch from Hebrew, and we're going to start using the Greek term that St. Paul used, the ethnos, Okay. So no longer goyi, now we're, we're ethnos. Okay. Let's turn to Acts 13. Acts 13. And in Acts 13, we have Paul's first missionary journey. And in this first missionary journey of Paul, he goes to Antioch in Pisidia. I'm looking at verse 14. Okay, so Acts 13, 14. And this is, this is known as Pisidian Antioch, is the location. And there were several places named Antioch because Antiochus, you know, was a big Greek guy. The different Antiochuses that, uh, that existed, Antiochy. Okay, let's look at verse uh, 14. They continued on from Perga and reached Antioch and Pisidia. On the Sabbath, they entered into the synagogue and took their seats. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent word to them. My brothers, if one of you has a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Okay, St. <laughs> Paul was probably, he's just burning, you know. He's just, he's like, yes, I have a word for you. <laughs> of course I do, you know. I studied under Gamaliel. You know, I, I've, I was knocked off of my horse. Well, the scripture doesn't say he was knocked off of the, his horse. It says that he fell to the ground, but he probably was upon a horse. And so, I mean, I've, the, you guys, wow, here we go. So Paul got up, motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites. Notice he doesn't say Jews. He says Israelites. And that's important. That's important. And I'll, I'll point, I'll show you in just a moment. Fellow Israelites and you others who are God-fearing, the Gentiles that are the ethnos that are among the, the Jews, that are God-fearers. They, they aren't completely Jews. They, they don't completely adhere to the law, but they, they adhere to some of the law. And they want to they hear the Torah and they want to learn. Kind of like inquirers in the Catholic faith, people who are inquiring into baptism, you know. They come to classes, they, they sit down, they go, okay, I'll go to Mass, that's cool. Okay, I, you know, I can follow the Ten Commandments, that's fine. But I'm, I, but I'm not going to quite buy it all yet, you know. I'm not going to be in, fully initiated. Okay, they're not quite uh, catechumens or, uh, they're not quite there. Okay, the God of this people, Israel, chose our ancestors and exalted the people during their sojourn in the land of Egypt. With uplifted arms, he led them out of it, and for about 40 years, he put up with them in the desert. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, which, by the way, the early church fathers saw the seven nations in the land of Canaan as a sign of the seven deadly sins that we have to conquer, he gave them their land as an inheritance. At the end of about 450 years... After these things, he provided judges up to Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. God gave them Saul, son of Kish, who I'm probably named after, Paul is thinking, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, just like I am, for 40 years. Then he removed him and raised up David as their king, 
Of him he testified, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my wit, my every wish. From this man's descendants, God, according to his promise, had br- has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. John heralded his coming by proclaiming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was completing his course, he would say, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. Behold, one is coming after me. I am not worthy to unfasten the sandals of his feet. My brothers, children of the family of Abraham, and those others among you who are God-fearing, to us this word of salvation has been sent. The inhabitants of Jerusalem and their leaders failed to recognize him, and by condemning him they fulfilled the oracles of the prophets that are read Sabbath after Sabbath. For even though they found no grounds for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him put to death. And when they had accomplished all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. These are now his witnesses before the people. We ourselves are proclaiming this gospel, this good news to you. That what God promised for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, this day I have begotten you, and that he raised him from the dead, never to return to corruption, he declared in this way, I shall give you the benefits assured to David. It's quoting Isaiah 55.3. That is why he also says in another psalm, you will not suffer your Holy One to corruption. Psalm 16, verse 10. Now David after he had served the will of God in his lifetime, fell asleep, was gathered to his ancestors and did see corruption. Not like St. Bernadette of Subriou, whose body is still perfectly incorrupt in Subriou, France. Has anybody ever been there and seen that? So if if anybody's ever like, yeah, right, you know, Jesus was incorrupt, go look at St. Bernadette. She's still got blue eyes. Eyes are not dilated. It's still perfectly incorrupt. Now David, after he had served the will of God in his lifetime, fell asleep, was gathered to his ancestors, and did see corruption. But the one whom God raised up did not see corruption. You must know, my brothers, that through him forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you, and in regard to everything from which you could not be justified under the law of Moses. In him every believer is justified. Be careful, then, about what was said in the prophets, not come about. He quotes Habakkuk 1.5. Look on, you scoffers, be amazed and disappear, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe, even if someone tells you. Now notice Paul says, be careful then that what was said in the prophets not come about. What do you mean not come about? That you're just like, you know, someone who doesn't believe in Habakkuk? No, something much greater. Habakkuk proclaimed this oracle about disbelief right before Jerusalem was destroyed as a warning to the people. St. Paul knows that judgment is coming to Jerusalem. And if you don't repent, guess, who, guess who's coming? <laughs> Titus, Flavius, Vespasianus, I think that's how you say his name, the Roman legions to destroy Jerusalem, just like what happened in the days of Habakkuk. As they were leaving, they invited them to speak on these subjects the following Sabbath. Hey, you're a pretty good preacher. You're a pretty good lecturer. We'd like to have you back. what's What's your fee? After the congregation had dispersed, many Jews and worshipers who were converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who spoke to them and urged them to remain faithful to the grace of God. Now notice, lots of Jews accept the gospel. Leaders, you know, Many Jews, worshipers who were converts to Judaism, you know, they, they, they had converted. And so when, sometimes the scriptures, even Paul will talk about, quote unquote, the Jews who, who are disbelieving. Well, he doesn't mean all Jews. He's a Jew. You know, Jesus is a Jew. Mary's a Jew. The 12 apostles were Jews. No, the Jews are specifically those unbelieving Jews. And it's very important to keep that in mind. Now, you know how I said a moment ago that it was important that he said Israel, my fellow Israelites, has hope that Israel has? I want you to look at 
chapter 26, verse 7. Chapter Acts 26, Acts 26, verse 7. And notice Paul says something very curious. Acts 26, verse 7. Our twelve tribes hope to attain to that promise as they fervently worship God day and night. Our twelve... Uh, Paul, <laughs> didn't you know that there's only three tribes left? Some Levites, Benjaminites, and Judahites? What do you mean, 12 tribes? What do you mean, 12 tribes? That doesn't make sense. Well, it does make sense. Let's see what what else he says at Pisidian Antioch in Acts 13, verse 44. On the following Sabbath, one week later, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When, quote-unquote, the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and with violent abuse contradicted what Paul had said. Both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and condemn yourselves as unworthy of eternal life, we now turn to the ethnos. And my English translation says Gentiles. Is that what all your translations say, Gentiles? For so the Lord has commanded us. For so the Lord has commanded us. And he quotes scripture. Quote, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may be an instrument of salvation to the ends of the earth. Now that, that is a, that's from Isaiah. And Isaiah is talking about the servant of the Lord. The suffering servant. I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may be an instrument of salvation to the ends of the earth. So he's saying that the servant, the suffering servant, will be a light to the goyi and, and, and that through you somehow salvation will reach the ends of the earth. Like through Abraham, worldwide blessing, worldwide salvation. Isaiah 49, 6. So let's turn back to Isaiah 49, 6 and look at the context of what Paul is quoting 49, chapter 49 of Isaiah, verse 6. Okay. We could even begin with verse 1. So I'm going to begin with verse 1. But 6 is what he quotes. Hear me, O coastlands. Listen, O distant peoples. The Lord called me from birth. From my mother's womb he gave me my name. He made of me a sharp-edged sword and concealed me in the shadow of his arm. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me. You are my servant, he said to me, Israel, through whom I show my glory. So who is the servant of the Lord? Israel. Israel is a... But Paul says that somehow he's Israel. And then other gospel authors quote Isaiah, talking about the servant of the Lord, referring to Jesus. So who is it? Well, ultimately, it's Jesus who is the new Israel. And then Jesus' body, the mystical body of Jesus, the church. Because you're united to Jesus. Let me say that again. It's Jesus who is the new Israel. Remember Jesus did what Israel failed to do in the desert? He ends up acting like Israel. He does what Israel did. He goes through the desert 40 days for 40 years, tempted by the devil, overcomes the devil, is obedient to God's word unlike Israel. Jesus is a new Israel. And so he's a new Israel. He's a servant of the Lord. And now we, in a certain sense, take up his vocation when we're united to him in baptism, when we come, become members of his mystical body. So, we, so this vocation of the servant of the Lord becomes, in a certain sense, our own. We are now a light. Paul is a light to the Gentiles. Okay, so let's look at this. Verse 4. Isaiah 49, verse 4. Though I thought I had toiled in vain, and for nothing uselessly spent my strength, 
Yet my reward is with the Lord, my recompense is with my God. For now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as his servant from the womb. That Jacob may be brought back to him, and Israel gathered to him. That's saying the, there, there's, a, there's a literary device where you say the same thing twice. And this happens a lot in the Psalms. It's like, uh, my dad is Raleigh Weber. Raleigh is my father. You're saying the exact same thing, but in a little bit of a different way. Okay, so he's saying that Jacob may be brought back to him and Israel gathered to him. Israel is Jacob's alter, alter, ulterior name. And I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord, and my God is now my strength. Okay, here's the key verse that Paul quotes. It is too little, he says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. That's too little of a thing. <laughs> well, for the Israelites, that was a huge thing. <laughs> you see, but he says, no, that's too little. Rather, Quote, I will make you a light to the, the goyi, the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So I don't want to just restore Israel. I want to restore everybody. I want to bring about the salvation of the goyi. Let's skip along a little bit later to verse 22. By the way, we could read from this whole, this whole all, all of my, the whole thing. I want to read before it. I want to read after it. I want to read all this. this is, Isaiah is amazing. Let's turn to verse 22. Verse 22 is going to tell us how Israel is going to be restored. How God is going to raise up the tribes of David. Verse 22 of Isaiah 49. Thus says the Lord God, See, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. So what's the how of the restoration? The goyi, the nations, are going to, this is the imagery, are going to take Israelites, the, the boys, in their arms, and are going to bring them back. And the goyi, the, the nations, are going to take the daughters of Israel on their shoulders and are going to bring them back. So how is Israel going to be restored? The Gentiles are going to bring the Israelites with them. And St. Paul knows this because St. Paul's mission is to the Jew and to the Gentile. And when he goes out to the Gentile, who is he going out to? All 12 tribes, those tribes that had been assimilated among the Gentiles. See, Isaiah knows this. Isaiah knows how this is going to come about. Isaiah knows the restoration. I mean, it's kind of like, duh. <laughs> it's, it, how else is it going to come about? It's, there's no other way. So that's kind of, that's kind of cool. And, I, and Paul knows this, and this is why he quotes from the strategic verse in Isaiah 49, verse 6. Let's look at Isaiah 51, verse 4. We're just going to keep looking at Isaiah. We're going to go through Isaiah a little bit, and I'm going to point out some passages. Isaiah 51, verse 4. Be attentive to me, my people, my folk. <laughs> the New American Bible, Lord, help us, my folk. <laughs> my folk, give ear to me. For law, oh my gosh, somebody buy me a revised standard version, please. And then transfer all of my notes to, to that Bible. Um, for law shall go forth from my presence and my judgment as a light of the peoples. I will make my justice come speedily. My salvation shall go forth and my arm shall judge the nations. In me shall the coastlands hope and my arm th they shall await. Raise your eyes to the heavens and look to the earth below. Though the heavens grow thin like smoke, the earth wears out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. My salvation shall remain forever. My justice shall never be dismayed. So basically, that's talking about how uh, he's the light of the peoples, and his arm shall judge the nations. So this, this servant of the Lord 
is going to, to deal with the nations. Let's go a little bit further to Isaiah 55. Now, this is a huge, huge passage in Isaiah. Isaiah 55, verse 3. And if you begin Isaiah 55, verse 1, all you who are thirsty come to the water. Where else is that in the New Testament? Revelation 21 talks about all you, you know, who are, who are thirsty, you know, come to the living waters, come to the water, drink from the water. Verse 3, come to me heedfully, listen that you may have life. I will renew with you the everlasting covenant, the benefits assured to David. Okay, the renewal of the Davidic covenant. As I made him a witness to the people's a leader and commander of nations, the goyi. So shall you summon a nation you knew not. And nations that knew you not shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, who has glorified you. So the servant Israel is going to be glorified, and this is going to be a light to the nations, that the nations who knew you not shall run to you. This kind of reminds me of the, the Nunc Dimitis, uh, what Simeon said in the temple to Joseph and Mary when they presented Jesus in the temple. Do you guys remember what he said? Now, Master, you may let your servant go in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory for your people Israel. This is Isaiah. That Simeon's speaking of, Simeon the prophet. That's Luke 2, 29 through 32. Luke 2, 29 through 32. Okay. So, you know, as we read the Old Testament, as we know our Old Testament, all of a sudden the New Testament is just coming to light. Oh, that's why Simeon said that. Man, that was really weird what he said. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 56, verse 3. I promise I won't bore you too much. I mean, it's sacred scripture, right? We can... We can. I mean, who can beat God's word? Isaiah 56, verse 3. Let not the foreigner say, when he would join him, this is Isaiah 56, verse 3. Let not the foreigner say, when he would join himself to the Lord, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, see, I am a dry tree. Uh, that's a, that's a, uh, an idiom. A euphemism for saying I can't have children because I'm a eunuch. I've, I've been castrated, to, to put it lightly. You know, uh, the textbook points out that eunuchs cannot become Jews. They're prohibited in Deuteronomy 23, verses 2 and 3. It says that anybody who has had his <clears throat> crushed cannot join my people, period. Can't. Okay, so if, God, if, if eunuchs are somehow going to be a part of God's people, they can't become Jews first, especially men eunuchs, you know, because they can't be circumcised, you know, if they don't have the, you know, that thing. Yeah, that heart to be circumcised. And this presents a great case for the apostles. Yes, go ahead, Tanya. Why were they castrated? Great question. Okay, okay, let's put it this way. Um, I have a teenager on the streets who has a shaved head, uh, who's, who loves heavy metal, who's just, you know, he, he, I think he's a good kid. Would you like to have him stay in your house for a week while you go off to work? No. Why not? You don't quite trust him. But what if, what if I took, you know, somebody who I knew was a goody two-shoe, a girl maybe, who, who loved my little ponies, you know, really a great track record, never sinned before as far as we know. Would you like to have her watch over your house? No. <laughs> yes. There's, you know, there's a difference there. Well, in the same way, eunuchs took care of the harem or the concubines of the kings. You, you can put two and two together and figure out why. Okay. Back, back to the passage at hand. Who did that to them? Uh, God forbid. I don't know who. But it happened. I don't know. Thank, just thank God that you live in the 21st century. Or, or, or you don't live in you know, other countries, I guess, that are less nice. 
Okay, Isaiah 55, verse 4. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who observe my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name. Better than sons and daughters, an eternal, eternal, imperishable name will I give them. So better than them have, being able to have children, I'll give them an imperishable name. And they will, they will have within my walls a monument and a name. Basically, they'll be a part of my people. Eunuchs will be able to be members of the, full members of the covenant family of God. And the foreigners who join themselves to the... And this is, by the way, this is why you, know, you have Philip baptizing the eunuch. The eunuch's reading Isaiah... And he's kind of like, I don't understand who the servant of the Lord is. And Philip goes up to him. Philip, the apostle, says, oh, let, let me interpret this for you. It's Jesus. And guess what? Isaiah also says you can become a member of the covenant family of God now because of Jesus. I'm sure Philip, I'm sure Philip you know, knew Acts 56. I mean, Isaiah 56. Okay, verse 6. And the foreigners, you know, the goyi, who join themselves to the Lord, ministering to him, loving the name of the Lord, and becoming his servants... All who keep the Sabbath free from profanation and hold to my covenant, them I will bring to my holy mountain and make joyful in my house of prayer. Their holocausts and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel. See, this is in inextricably connected with the gathering of Israel the salvation of the foreigners. Isaiah kind of talks about the two interchangeably. Others will I gather to him besides those already gathered. Okay, we're almost finished with Isaiah. Almost finished. Let's turn to Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, the glory of the new Zion. Yay, Isaiah. Rise up, verse 1, rise up in splendor. Your light has come. The glory of the Lord shines upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick clouds cover the peoples. But upon you the Lord shines, and over you appears his glory. Again, here's the idea of the glorification of Israel that Simeon talks about. Nations shall walk by your light, and kings by your shining radiance. Raise your eyes and look about. They all gather and come to you. Their sons come from afar, and your daughters in the arms of their nurses. And again, there's the idea of the daughters of Israel coming in the arms of the nurses of the Gentiles. There, then you shall be radiant at what you see. Your heart shall throb and overflow, for the riches of the sea shall be emptied out before you. The wealth of nations shall be brought to you. Caravans of camels shall fit you. Dromedaries from Midian and Ephah, all from Sheba come, bearing gold and frankincense and proclaiming the praises of the Lord. Hence why gold and frankincense were brought to Jesus by the three magi. Okay, this is fulfilling Isaiah 60. Now, the diaconate formation program that my friend went through failed to mention the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> of course Jesus knew Isaiah. He knew it so, so well that that's, what he, that's the scroll that he unrolled in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth in Luke, I believe it's chapter 4, and he read from Isaiah and said, this is, this is being fulfilled, you know, as you hear these words. Jesus knew Isaiah. He knew that, that this was for all the nations. Okay. Let's turn to the very end of Isaiah. And so you know I can't go any further. Isaiah 66, verse 18. This is great. Just in case, if, if you haven't you know, gotten what he's had to say yet, he says it again. I come to gather, this is Isaiah 66, verse 18. I come to gather nations of every language. They shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them. From them I will send fugitives to the nations, to Tarshish, Put, and Lud, Masak, I'm probably martyring these names, Tubal and Javan, to the distant coastlands that have never heard of my fame or seen my glory, and they shall proclaim my glory among the nations. They shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as an offering to the Lord, on horses and in chariots and carts upon mules and dromedaries, to Jerusalem, my holy mountain, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their offering to the house of the Lord in clean vessels. Some of these I will take as priests and Levites, says the Lord. Wait a minute. <laughs> How can you take Levites from non-Levites? 
what does he mean he's going to take priests and Levites from these peoples? That's odd. It's like saying, I'm going to take an American from the Germans. <laughs> you can't do that, <laughs> you know. I, I want to take a, you know, a, a South African from a North Africa. It just doesn't make sense. Well, basically, I'm going to take ministers, you know, from the Gentiles, just as there are ministers from the Israelites, so, that, so there will be Gentile ministers. And St. Luke saw himself as one of those, because he was one. He was a missionary companion of Paul. He was ordained. Right, he's going to keep them on an equal footing. Yes, precisely. Okay, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Now we get to look at some of St. Paul. Man, St. Paul in Ephesians. St. Paul, now that you know this, and and you're knowing the Old Testament better, and you're knowing this narrative better, St. Paul's epistles are going to make much better sense. You're going to see St. Paul's arguments come much clearer. But in Ephesians 1, verse 15, we read this. By the way, I commend all you guys for staying through this Bible study to, to chapter 26. This is incredible. This is really good. This is wonderful. I mean... The, uh, uh, what, we had an uh, attrition rate of about, I would say, 40%. Maybe about 60% are still here. I mean, who come regularly. We still have people who come half of the time. And then we have co- people come a third of the time. Some people come two out of every three. I really commend you guys. Way to go. Way to put up with me. Did you know that this entire scripture study is about 40 hours of listening to me drone on and on? Isn't that amazing? You're going to have listened to me for 40, an entire work week. Wow. Only if you wish you got a paycheck. Ephesians 1.15. The attrition rate would be better. It definitely... Okay. Therefore, I too, hearing of your faith in the Lord Jesus... By the way, he's writing to both Jews and Gentiles who have become Christians. I too, hearing of your faith in the Lord Jesus and of your love for all the holy ones, do not cease giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of Sophia and Apocalypse, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, resulting in knowledge of him. May the eyes of your hearts be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope that belongs to his call, What are the riches and glory of his inheritance among the holy ones? And what is the surpassing greatness of the power for us who believe in accord with the exercise of his great might? Which he worked in Christ, raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens. Okay, that's an allusion to Daniel 7. And also Ezekiel 2 and Ezekiel 8. But primarily Daniel 7. That he seated Christ up. Seated Christ up. So let's skip down to verse uh, 4 of chapter 2. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you once lived, following the age of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the desires of our flesh, following the wishes of the flesh and the impulses. You know, your disordered passions, your weakened will, your darkened intellect, following concupiscence. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest, but God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Now, obviously, we're not ascended into heaven, but we share in Christ's authority right now. This is Daniel 7, when the when he, the Son of Man is presented among the Ancient of Days, he, sh- he shares all glory and kingship with the saints. That in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from you, it is the gift of God. It is not from works, so no one may boast. For we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God is prepared in advance that we should live in them. Now, some people see that since Paul is talking about good works in verse 10, it must be works, good works he's talking about in verse 9, but that's not the works that he's talking about when he says works in verse 9. He's talking about a different type of works, works that separate Jew from Gentile. This is why in verse 11 he says, Therefore, remember 
that at one time you ethnos, Gentiles, in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by those called the circumcision, which is done in the flesh by human hands, were at that time without Christ, because you did not participate in the works of the law, the ergonomo. You were separated. At, were at that time without Christ, alienated from the citizenship of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Wow, that was, they were in dire straits. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have become near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He who made both one and broke down the dividing wall of enmity through his flesh, abolishing the law with its commandments and legal claims, that he might create in himself one new person in place of the two, thus establishing peace. The dividing wall. He's not just using metaphor. There was a dividing wall, the wall of the temple that separated the court of the Gentiles from the rest of the temple. But that has been broken down now. Now Christ is the true temple, and both are on the same footing in Christ. Gentiles are now a part of the covenant family of God on the same level as the Jews, because the Mosaic law, the national law that separated the Israelites from the nations, has been abolished. Christ took upon himself the Deuteronomic curses of the Deuteronomic covenant. He suffered all those curses, so that by being baptized, the Jew would experience the benefits of the redemption, and would be delivered from the Deuteronomic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant that, that was do, where they were doomed to die, where the Deuteronomic covenant was basically a damn, damning covenant. Paul elsewhere calls it a covenant of condemnation. And so they're delivered from that so that they can enter the renewed Davidic covenant, the family of God, be on the same footing as Gentiles, and now they can live at peace with one another. And there's no longer two people but one in Christ Jesus in his mystical body. Okay, I know that's a lot. We're going to talk about it more next week because we're going to cover St. Paul in more depth. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you tremendously again for the gift of Jesus Christ who became a curse for us, who was hung upon a tree. We thank you for condemning the flesh, for doing away with our slavery to the devil, our slavery to the passions, and giving us the spirit that frees us, that animates us. So Holy Spirit, oh Lord Holy Spirit, ignite in us a fire, a flame of love, that we may become great saints, that we may become virtuous. Help us pray this week. Help remind us to pray. Help us pray well. We love you, Lord Holy Spirit. Thank you for all of your gifts, your sevenfold gifts. We ask for you to renew them within us this week as we live out Lent and follow our Savior Jesus Christ ever more intensely. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.